and government and govern and govern uh, government officials as uh, as uh, as a uh, uh, as uh, functionaries, I think would apply very well to the Moroccan political context. Okay? Would you all say or speak of this uh, freely without any problems at the uh, Moroccan university? I, I never uh, restrained myself from uh, from uh, saying. I uh, uh, in my, uh, you have noticed that uh, in my whole talk, I have not talked about the king as a person, because in fact, I I see the problems of Morocco as institutional. And the king is very nice, I think he's very nice, but for me the problems are related to the institutions and I would say such, otherwise I would never have come back to them. Mm -hmm. But this presentation you could hold it. Yeah, I would have said it, yes. I, I say these kind of things in uh, my, to my students. <laughs> uh, but otherwise I would not be in Morocco, uh, I would uh, decide to leave. <laughs> yes. Well, they are, uh, uh, constitutionally, he has gained, uh, uh, you know, some new powers, uh, such as, for example, uh, deciding on new positions. But then it is limited because the, there are these differences uh, between strategic positions and non-strategic. So clearly, the strategic positions he can propose, but the decision is made by the monarch. And uh, 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 there are some. I mean, the new constitution has given new <coughs> here and there. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, there are still major problems, and, and I will deal with this uh, at the end. Uh, uh, do I still have time? Uh, well, I have ten more minutes, yes. Uh, uh, is, is that fine? No, well, I mean, you know, because of half uh, lecture and half uh, question and answer. So I can continue? No, you can continue. I mean, as, as long as it's interactive, of course. Yeah. Okay, yes, no, I would like it to be interactive, uh, except that by the end I can make it, uh, uh, I can stop, you know, and then I can receive a question. But I can say more. Okay. So anyway, so, uh, uh, I will deal with the last point, because I told you there are four points. The last point, which is, uh, what makes Morocco different? from other contexts, before I speak more specifically about the constitutional reform. So, uh, now in comparison to uh, Egypt, Tunisia, uh, uh, and C uh, to a certain extent to, C uh, to Syria, uh, something very interesting was, that, is that in Syria, Egypt, and Tunisia, people could Pinpoint to somebody, and that somebody was either Mubarak or yes, and uh, or Gaddafi, uh, uh, not in Morocco. Morocco, the, the Moroccan king has what I would call a symbolic capital, and he is honestly more humane and nice person, uh, and he has been trying to do different things, as I told you. So in Morocco, as opposed to these many years, you know, for the Mubarak, in Morocco we had seen a change of faith. Okay, because he, uh, he is relatively new, <coughs> on, uh, only 1999, and I think that played an important role in terms of the outcomes that took place in Morocco. Okay, now, let's say if Hassan II, his father, was still in power, yes, maybe we would have a different kind of outcome. Because Hassan II was not the kind of, and he never wanted to give the idea that he is a liberal monarch. Okay? Uh, and Hassan was relatively more ruthless. Okay? He killed, uh, uh, we had uh, uh, our share of people being imprisoned and killed. Uh, we refer to that in France as les années de grand, years of the death, where people were jailed and killed under Hassan II. So that's kind. Of, so I think in Morocco, the fact that we have seen a change of of face, the fact that uh, quickly Mohammed VI became associated with the, an image of a liberal monarch, sort of created a change uh, in comparison to uh, to um, to other contexts in the Middle East. Okay. Another important factor also is the fact. Uh, other than the or direct, you know, you put pinpoint at somebody. So Mohammed VI was born was not pinpointed, but the system was through the February. Otherwise, the Mahzen and was pinpointed, but not had. So 
the slogan that was very common in Morocco is down with corruption, down with the Mahzen, and they didn't mean by that the, the king himself, but the, the system that uh, made corruption, down with corruption. So in Egypt, the, the main slogan was down with the regime. Okay? That was not the case in Morocco. Okay? And you have this uh, something very important uh, uh, difference. Another important aspect, that, that uh, important difference uh, of, uh, that, uh, in the context of Morocco is that uh, uh, the fact that uh, people di uh, did not ask it down with the regime meant that the reaction also was not very violent. I honestly don't know what would have happened if people had asked down with the regime. But it did not happen and uh, the reaction of uh, the regime was not violent. Of course, there were occasional problems here and there, and I think uh, one or two deaths of people in demonstrators, but nothing in comparison. So uh, this is something uh, very important uh, to keep in mind. Another difference uh, uh, in comparison to other uh, uh, states uh, is that uh, the fact that, there, there were, that uh, the king was associated with liber liberal, more liberal uh, reforms I think played in favor of uh, uh, the Moroccan uh, scenario. Of course, there is the long history that I told you. Okay, uh, Morocco has been able to establish uh, uh, here. Uh, I mean, since the 17th century, a solid uh, system and uh, uh, well-established, uh, uh, you know, monarchical institutions. And again, uh, the difference which I mentioned earlier. Uh, there was a kind of more intelligent ways of dealing with the, with the, with the, with the problem. Now, of course, Morocco, it's always nice to speak about that, but, but Morocco had the advantage of time, because it took place in another context and then, so Moroccan officials could naturally see the problems that were taking place and they wanted to avoid uh, uh, some of uh, 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 the problems uh, that uh, what other differences can we think about uh, when uh, in, compa in comparison to... Uh, uh, yes, a very important difference is this multi-party system. Okay? Uh, uh, Morocco, in comparison to a number of other countries, has had, uh, as I mentioned, since the independence, a multi-party system. And uh, it was relatively, a, in comparison, more open uh, space in comparison to a place like Syria or Qatar, which was totally uh, non, not present. And I think this played a, a favor. But it, is, it played a favor in, in both ways. In the sense that uh, people could engage in some sort of, uh, you know, coming to, uh, to some sort of constitutional reform. But it also played in favor of the regime. Because... Uh, the fact that you do not have a powerful party yes, that could counter the regime meant that the regime can play with all of these parties as, uh, as it did. Uh, this is in, in political science is referred to as segmentary politics. What is segmentary politics? And there is a book, in fact, about this on Morocco, more specifically. It's called The Commander of the Faithful, of the Faithful by John Waterbury. And he applied segmentary politics. What is segmentary politics? Well, segmentary politics initially uh, uh, is associated with the analysis of the tribal system, of the tribal system in different parts of the, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, the Middle East. But Waterbury used this segmentary policy to analyze the nature of the political system in Morocco, and more specifically the party. So what is this? Basically what John Waterbury is arguing is that the monarch being above party politics, yes, he is the arbitrator, yes, and he, is, he could always play out these differences of different parties. So the, so the multi-party system meant that the monarch would give sometimes power to this party, yes, especially when the elections are all were all made up, yes, and then stop, and then give to the other party, and then and this is called segmentary party. Otherwise, the parties are always become always after 
power. Okay? And in fact, this is one of the uh, processes that ultimately led to what I called here the domestication of the political party. So, segmentary politics still plays today a role. And in fact, I cannot uh, see it differently. The very fact that we have the PGD that came to power, in fact, it is a continuation of the segmentary policy. Because in 1999, in 1999, right after the death of Hassan II, in fact, who was given the, the right to take uh, a power? It is the Yusef Bey, the, the old left-wing party. And it is through that that facilitated the transition. Okay? It became known as the gouvernement d'alternance, our chairman's government. And in fact, it is not by coincidence that they called the new government the PGD, the second alternative government. And for me, it's a, it's a continuation because I'm sure that the PGD will next, I mean, there will be some, maybe, uh, or maybe not, that's, that's the problem. Uh, uh, the, because ultimately, the PGD will fall victim to this position. And they will, uh, uh, they will lose uh, gradually power. They are very popular today. Okay? And by the way, since we are speaking about the PGD and the Islamist party uh, in Morocco, and the fact that it will lead to uh, uh, itself, they will lose legitimacy in the same way that the left-wing party lost legitimacy. Because once you integrate a system that is clearly uh, not, uh, I mean, a system where you accept the rule of the game, you basically are open to quickly to it. I mean, in fact, they are already facing a number of problems, you know, because of uh, 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 economic problems, and gradually, I believe, they would lose uh, in, uh, legitimacy in the same way that the Yusuf Bey lost legitimacy, and what remains, the palace, with, as the main uh, dominant political force, with the symbol of stability and things like that. Okay. Uh, uh, now, to, go, to give this a regional dimension, and uh, since I am speaking about the Islamist, uh, 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 the Islamic uh, party, for many, many years, authoritarian regimes in the Middle East have uh, postponed the democratic project, yes, very often by saying, well, if we engage with democracy, we will end up with radical Islamists and things like that. And of course, this is justification for keeping power. And of course, the Europeans and the United States also were going along. And uh, if you look at the Europeans and the, the, uh, uh, the United States, they call this the uh, they call it the stability paradigm. Stability paradigm. Well, in international relations, what they mean by the stability paradigm is the fact that yes, you know, it doesn't matter if we support this authoritarian ruler, yes, Saddam Hussein, or. Uh, whatever, uh, Mubarak, but at least it is a, a form of, it, 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 it uh, gives us a form of stability, yes? So the stability paradigm is clearly something that the Europeans and uh, the United States have relied upon for many, many years in order to support authoritarian movements, okay? Uh, and this is something that one, uh, what one needs, um, especially for you who are from Europe and the United States, I mean, the fact that sometimes we have authoritarian I mean, there is some sort of uh, important role being played by Europe and the United States. Remember that, that Ben Ali was being supported by the French in, in the very end. And uh, this is why one, one minister was, uh, 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 was uh, taken out of... Uh, so Sarkozy was a great supporter of uh, Ben Ali. Okay? We, we should not have, forget... Uh, memory is important. And... Uh, the same thing applies for the United States. And this is something to keep in mind. The fact that we have authoritarian regimes in the Middle East is very much because it is part of also European and US policy. Okay? And the, uh, it's an important uh, uh, factor to think about, which is beyond the culturalist uh, factor that I mentioned in the very beginning. Uh, there are strategic reasons. And, and uh, in fact, this speaks about the, in, uh, the uh, European and US uh, inherent contradictions in foreign policy. While they are speaking about the ideals of liberal democracy and all of these wonderful words and human rights, 
they are simultaneously supporting the most authoritarian regime. Now, anyway, to go back to this idea of the paradigm, stability paradigm, in fact, my point is that this stability paradigm was also ideological. Even though it was relied upon by many European and United States, because, in fact, there was no stability. The only uh, stability was only in the mind, because how do we explain this total disaster that we have in the Middle East? This is a very, the Middle East has been a very unstable situation. Iraq was, uh, and Saddam Hussein was uh, supported by the United States and Europe, and look at the instability that it created. Uh, uh, France supported the, uh, the military junta in Algeria. Look at the kind of instability that, uh, that took place in Algeria. And the reason, in fact, why European, uh, uh, European policy makers think of stability in this sense, because they think of stability in the very short term. Stability for them is what happened within the next year or two. Stability for me is what happened within the next year, uh, 30 years or 40 years. And if they were thinking about stability in the long term, 30 years, I think they should not be supporting this kind of... Uh, 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 for me, democracy is uh, honestly a much more stable uh, thing. And if there is anything that Europe and the United States should be doing, is at least to start promoting more democratic uh, reforms. And uh, uh, I think the EU now has become sort of more aware of this, okay? Uh, and this should, by the, by the way, not exclude the Gulf regimes and the Saudi Arabia, which we tend not to talk about because they are providing us with oil. So I think uh, in order to talk about the Middle East and North Africa, one should not concentrate just all about what happened in Germany, but also about the policy orientation of uh, uh, Europe, European uh, uh, states and the United States, which are replete with contradictions and uh, inconsistencies. Uh, so, uh, I was speaking about what makes uh, Morocco uh, uh, a different uh, country. Do you have any questions so far? Yes. Yes, you just mentioned this, the importance of external implications, right? Yes. So would you like to make any comments on uh, implications of external politics or external relations of Morocco on internal dynamics? Because we have seen so far what it happens in the internal political system. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Morocco has occupied less than Sahara. Morocco is backed by France and the US. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how does this uh, go? Okay. Uh, uh, can you repeat your questions? Uh, uh, what, what would you like me to respond to uh, more specifically? Sure. Thank you very much for the insight mm -hmm. on the internal political system. Mm -hmm. Do you see that the external politics of the country has anything to do? Does it affect at all what happens internally? Uh, of course, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, Morocco is not such uh, a uh, powerful state to have any kind of effect on the international scene. But uh, if there are if there are external factors, it's certainly the position of the EU and uh, the United States. And as I told you, uh, the, uh, Europe, uh, uh, France, uh, they have been very supportive of Hassan II, uh, regardless of uh, of uh, his. Uh, uh, authoritarian regimes regardless. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it is clear that foreign policy is very much uh, uh, depending on interests and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, what, what is of interest uh, in, to the US and uh, uh, to Europe. But uh, certainly, I think, uh, I think uh, the fact that these regimes, including the Moroccan regime, uh, have uh, lasted, it, 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 it certainly, uh, I mean, as I mentioned, the, the position of the United States and uh, Europe vis-a-vis uh, 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 -vis what the Moroccan region does is important. Uh, I think recently I, I was, uh, I heard, uh, I heard of something in Europe, I was in the European Parliament, and they were now thinking more about this idea of, uh, uh, you know, you, 
there is a special phrase that they call it now. You, you get uh, this after you do this, you see? And I think, uh, what? Ultimatum violence. Yeah, yes, so, uh, so uh, I think they are thinking more now, uh, but they have to do that again with this stability notion, because they are still stuck to this stability aspect. And therefore, them, as I, I still insist, stability for them is always short term. Uh, but they, we have seen a slight change, or at least there are attempts. Because in the EU, one needs to keep in mind that they are also in this kind of institution, there are different levels. So when I was talking to a number of uh, you know, people at the lower level, who, people who prepare things to propose, now they are really, uh, 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 they sometimes are in contradiction with what the officials say. You see, they are, uh, in, in, the, in such institutions, you have these kinds of. Uh, so people that we met in the EU sometimes have uh, have diff uh, differences with their own officials. So uh, so you have these kinds of dynamics as well. Um, your reference to the uh, Western Sahara uh, and, uh, the occupation. I I uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Western Sahara is a subject that I really never gave a talk about or like to talk about because I am uh, more interested in. Uh, in democratic issues and establishing the rule of law and real and meaningful democratic institutions in Morocco, which for me ultimately would facilitate the uh, re resolution of the uh, of the Sahara issue within a regional uh, component, but within a democratic component. So, personally, I see the issue of the Sahara. Uh, uh, I mean, the more we work on the establishment of real democracy the more I see more light in, uh, in the tunnel as far as the uh, otherwise as the uh, Western uh, the, the Sahara issue because ultimately uh, and they are be, they have been speaking about it uh, regionalization uh, can be some sort of uh, uh, alternative but within real democratic uh, context so I so I think to fight for democracy in Morocco ultimately can play an important role in terms of the, uh, Solving the Sahara. Yes, please. Yes. <clears throat> I had two comments. Yes. And rather a long question. There you go. Okay. My first comment um, I, I really uh, would like to emphasize what you just said about um, the um, European and US policies because, uh, again, their support of certain regimes for the sake of stability, quote unquote has proven wrong all along, and they are still continuing to do that. And I'm giving, again, the example of the tireless efforts to support uh, the accession of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, thinking that this is a viable alternative. OK? So I would like to uh, agree with you on that point. The other comment is just a brief. You mentioned early on that, um, that the regimes, the Arab regimes, would uh, say that if we have democratization, then uh, we're going to bring in the radical Islamists, okay? And you mentioned that Mubarak said that. Actually, Mubarak never said that. Mubarak said, if I go now, during the revolution, he said, if I go now, it's either me or chaos, and you will get the Islamists, okay? But he never said, if we have democracy, we will get the Islamists, for a very simple reason, is that he, was convincing us for the past 20 years that we were living in a state of democracy. So he couldn't have used that argument. He did say that only when he was asked to step down. But he did not say if to use democracy, because he believed that we were using, we were, you know, a democratic state. Which, in a sense... Do, do you believe that? No, I don't believe that we were a democratic state. But in a sense, we had a lot of things as well. I mean, a lot of reforms in in that area. But I also would like to hear, this will take me to a question. You said that Morocco's case is very different from other countries because um, the king has issued some reforms, etc. But I would like to also ask you, in Egypt, we also have several parties. It's true we have a dominant party, which was the NDP, but we did have other parties since the days of Anwar Sadat. Okay? So we have a theoretically a multi-party system that is always uh, used like, you know, we used to call them cartoon parties, okay, because they were manipulated by the president and his ruling party. So we do have 
the smart system. One other thing, um, you say that you talked about um, the fact that there were reforms and, and that the people did not call for the fall of the regime because there were reforms happening in the economy, etc. The same thing was happening in Egypt. Um, the fact that you talked about the Mahzal, okay, which is what we have also as Muassasa de Riesa in, in Egypt during the times of Mubarak and Sadat, and the people around them. So we have something very similar, okay? I would like you to comment on, although we have all these similarities, okay, uh, and I must admit that in the past few years, uh, we have witnessed uh, some changes in Egypt, um, and uh, economic changes, and, and uh, more freedom of speech, etc. And yet, the people revolted in Egypt, and they did not. I would like you to comment on this basic difference because we have had all these things as well. But the people went out and said, down with the regime. But they didn't in Morocco. And that is a question I have been like, thinking about for a couple, couple of days. And I even spoke about that um, yesterday and the day before with Pascal. I said there must be something about monarchies because there is not a single monarchy in the Arab world that has fallen in spite of the fact that people went out on the streets and they demonstrated in Morocco, in Jordan, in Bahrain. But there is something about the idea of the monarchy that prevents people from taking a step further. I would like your okay. comment on that. Well, thank you so much. Sorry. No, 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 no. Thank you so much for your comment. Um, now, I do agree with you uh, on the fact that there was that there are some similarities uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the kind of economic reforms that uh, uh, that were taking place, structural adjustment programs and things like that, liberalization of the economy. But honestly, I slightly disagree in the sense that I still see uh, major differences. Uh, because as I mentioned, the, the, the monarchy has a long history in Morocco, which is not the case uh, uh, in Egypt. Uh, the monarchy has been able to concoct a, all sorts of different legitimacies and, uh, 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 and uh, it has this background uh, that, that one can... Uh, now, the other thing is that... Uh, and I can tell you a little anecdote. Uh, about uh, uh, four years ago, I went to Egypt for a conference, and I honestly, I came back and I was talking to my brother, who is also a political scientist. Uh, I, I told him, I really think that uh, 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 Egypt is a ticking bomb. Uh, because during my, uh, my, uh, my visit, I saw, that, uh, honestly, more, uh, I mean, clearly, more major economic problems. I could see that. I, I was very saddened uh, in my hotel when I was stopped by uh, one of the policemen uh, who asked me, uh, he was, you know, joking with me and uh, asked me, uh, 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 can, uh, can you give me my, your shoe? I, initially, I thought he was joking. You know, I said, wow, I know. But then I literally, he, he showed me his shoe and it was, it has a hole in it. And I was very sad. Uh, and unfortunately, that was the only shoe I had. Otherwise, I would have uh, given him my shoe. But, uh, but those kind, and I, then when I was taking cabs, I talked to people, uh, and I felt that there is, it's not that Morocco is ideal. You know, we have, uh, you know. There's a difference in numbers, of course. Uh, yeah, and then there's a difference in numbers. Yeah. But I did feel more serious economic problems. Uh, that, and that, this would make, again, Morocco uh, a sort of a different uh, 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 case scenario. Another thing that would make uh, Morocco different, uh, again, is what I mentioned about uh, 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 literally pinpointing. Uh, so there is something that happens in Morocco, which again is some, uh, one has to wonder about. Uh, people with all different kinds of claims, economic claims, and uh, you know they are in front of the parliament, which is another revealing aspect, uh, which I, I have not mentioned, but I can come back to. They are in front of the parliament, asking for uh, you know uh, for uh, either jobs or things. But uh, some of them are lifting the picture of the monarch. And so I think the monarch has what I call here a symbolic...